pleasure to introduce our president and CEO, Wendy Herbert, who's going to be our MC for the event today. Uh, over to you, Wendy. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, welcome everyone. As uh, Ryan said, that today's event is sponsored by SAS. The title of it is Toward the Horizon, Toward the Horizon How COVID-19 is Accelerating Innovation in Pharmaceutical and Life Sciences Analytics. As we begin, I would like to acknowledge that I'm joining this event from within the ancestral, traditional and unceded territory of the Coast Salish peoples, including the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and Salatooth First Nations. As Ryan mentioned, uh, Life Sciences BC is a non-governmental, not-for-profit organization, um, which is basically um, funded through membership. Our members consist of academia, research institutions, centers of excellence, digital health, med tech, therapeutics companies and organizations, such as SAS, and those companies that provide uh, support and services tailored specifically for the life sciences ecosystem. This event is made possible through the support of SAS, and we're very excited to have SAS as one of our newer members, but also have the opportunity of share with you their deep expertise in the world of data. At each event, we love we like to uh, announce our newest members. For today, we're um, acknowledging Coastal Genomics, Prompt Health, and Immunity Diagnostics. Welcome. As a member-funded organization, we're always welcoming new members, so please reach out to any of us at LSBC, or as Ryan said, go on our website. We'd be, ha be happy to talk with you and tell you more about what we do. So on to um, our program. SAS is a leader in analytics, is our presenting sponsor today. With more than 40 years of innovation, SAS is a trusted analytics powerhouse for organizations seeking immediate value from their data. A deep bench of analytic solutions and broad industry knowledge keep customers coming back and feeling confident. In life sciences, SAS delivers innovative technologies to help customers deliver better, safer therapies to patients faster in a highly regulated landscape. SAS helps life, sci life science companies rise to the challenges of digital health, improving the way they discover, develop, and manufacture um, and commercialize therapies. Today's life sciences experts from SAS will be speaking to us about how COVID-19 is accelerating innovation in life sciences analytics. As we all know, the life sciences in industry is thrives on innovation, so it's no surprise that COVID-19 is rapidly driving innovative analytic solutions to address key challenges posed by the crisis. In fact, the innovation that has come out of COVID-19 would not have been possible without the analytics that is driving many of our discoveries, whether it be thera therapeutics, vaccines, or digital health solutions. In this session, we'll explore the impact of pandemic on pharmaceutical manufacturers and the resulting acceleration of digitization as the industry responds and adapts. As we've all seen and experienced, life sciences companies are taking advantage of digital health and virtual trial methodologies to mitigate delays on clinical research. They're using epidemiological modeling to study and predict the potential for using real world data to gather evidence for COVID-19 therapies. They're evolving their sales and marketing strategies to optimize the overnight shift to digital channels to connect with prescribers. Our expert speakers will share the perspectives on lessons learned and the road ahead. So I'm going to introduce all of our speakers at once um, and then they will speak. And at the end, we will um, then move to a Q&A. So as Ryan said, please um, add questions to the Q&A, which I'll be monitoring um, and engage in the chat. Our first speaker will be Dr. Mark Lambrick. He's the Director of Global Health and Life Sciences Practice at SAS. Mark joined SAS in 2005 and now leads a senior team working for SAS Healthcare and Life Sciences Industry and Organizations. For the past few years, he's been focusing on the impact of digital health and real world data in converging healthcare ecosystem. He applies SAS high performance analytics to generate new insights and improve patient outcomes. Next will be Stan Rogiers. He's a principal industry consultant for life sciences at SAS. Prior to joining SAS in 2015, Stan worked in the pharmaceutical industry for 20 years. At SAS, he's focused on providing industry expertise and strategic support to customers. Following Sten will be Shireen. She's a health and life sciences industry consultant at SAS. Shireen has more than 20 years of experience in real world evidence, epidemiology and biostatistics. 
Most recently, before joining SAS in 2017, she worked at Teva Pharmaceuticals as a biostatistician and epidemiologist supporting regulatory safety, late phase and post-marketing activities across therapeutic areas using clinical and real world data to glean real world insight. And our final speaker will be Patrick Homer, who's an industry lead for commercial life science analytics at SAS. Prior to joining SAS in 2008, Patrick spent 20 years in the commercial life sciences sector. At SAS, Patrick helps customers navigate the complexities of digital transformation and brings a deep understanding of predictive analytics, optimization, and AI to help them involve their analytical capabilities. So welcome to our speakers. As Ryan mentioned, it's a great privilege. We have people joining us from Wales, Belgium, and Pennsylvania, and possibly somewhere else. So obviously we're in Vancouver and there's um, many of our attendees that are spread across our province and country. So I'm looking forward to a great session. Data is a huge passion of mine. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you also to um, for the introduction, the nice introduction, and for inviting us to give this uh, presentation. Um, as as we discussed that beforehand, I'm I'm looking forward to the day that the pandemic will be over and we can actually come to Vancouver and visit you for a webinar there. But um, in this uh, digital world, we're very happy to to meet you virtually, and to talk about some of the best practices and experiences we have seen. In, um, in dealing with data and helping pharmaceutical manufacturers and healthcare organizations throughout the world, uh, dealing with the impact of, of the pandemic as we have seen it. And this will be a very much a perspective from the SAS point of view. Um, we brought a team together with different um, expertise, um, uh, backgrounds and, and different uh, uh, having worked in different projects. So I think you'll you'll like the presentation in terms of what we are seeing in the industry. Uh, we'll also be able to touch a little bit on what is the impact in digitalization? What is the impact of COVID-19 beyond the actual pandemic? Because it, it is very clear that there will be an impact. So um, on I would like to start with talking about the impact on the American medicine, the article, or medicine at large, the healthcare system at large. We cannot speak about life sciences companies and pharmaceutical manufacturers without talking about the impact for the patient itself, because in doing clinical research in manufacturing these uh, therapies, in looking after the safety, in ensuring that uh, healthcare providers and, and physicians are being informed correctly, the patient is at the center of where this pandemic is really hitting a heart um, for them. And so um, the article that was published in the New Yorker earlier in the year described the atmosphere at the start of the pandemic really, really well and the impact on the whole healthcare um, system really in the US specifically. But I think what was described in that article was really valid across uh, the globe as well. And um, uh, Really, we should start with um, quoting Warren Buffett, uh, who said that when the tide goes out, you discover who has been swimming naked. And this has really been what we've seen in the pandemic. The vulnerabilities in the system were exposed and all organizations were scrambling to get information together and get a view on the situation. And we call that um, kind of the response phase in, in which you try to reorient yourself. You're looking at what's happening and what can we do uh, to ensure that healthcare keeps running? What can we do to keep our operations uh, intact? A big part of that is information, is data, and is the ability to uh, generate insights on top of that data. And so what we've seen in healthcare systems in working with uh, government healthcare agencies around the world and working with hospitals in working with pharmaceutical manufacturers is that supply chains were not set out to deal with this pandemic in terms of personal protective equipment, they fell short. Um, they, were not, um, they were not in in time, they were really just in case. Huh? Um, we need to go um, from a just in time to a just in case kind of supply chain. We need to have buffer capacity in there and that was not available. A surveillance ca capability was not put in place or is not uh, able to serve this type of uh, scale of pandemic that we saw. Many countries were um, ill-prepared to deal with that. And we've helped many agencies and we've helped many 
um, hospital systems and pharmaceutical companies just get a handle on what is happening and how can we look at where the pandemic is going and until today we see the same thing in Europe for example where we are where there's a new surge in parts of the US we need see new surges and the ability to predict that better was key uh, a key um, aspect of what we did out there and certainly my colleagues and uh, we'll talk about that a little bit more faster recycling of existing therapies helping the patients having collaboration between stakeholders and getting them through that crisis was important regulators were not ready to deal with um, uh, approving tests as fast as they could um, how can you approve a test before the pandemic is really breaking out without having any patients in uh, in your health system at the initial initial stages of the pandemic that was really what regulators were facing with they were not set up for that kind of approval and finally and that's something that was published in in the economist uh, this week as well again is that uh, digital health records are not able to be uh, are not interoperable uh, healthcare systems were not able to exchange information and uh, to do that rapidly enough and so um, looking at how from the SaaS side we deal with it we really scrambled and put a uh, system together and the next slide you can see that in which we responded to this crisis. We clearly evaluated like many organizations, probably like some of your organizations that are internal organizations was not set out to help um, healthcare organizations and pharmaceutical managers in the best possible way. And what we did is we adopted a incident command system, which is a well-known system described in a methodology to respond to crises that allowed us to pull together people from all across the organization and put them into different teams. One of the additional cells that we created in there was a, a scientific advisory team. And we will go a little bit deeper in the next slide to look into that, how we pull together um, people with different types of expertise. For example, uh, COVID-19 um, epidemiologists and uh, public health experts, people that were specialized in bringing data together and applying the right type of analytics, because this was clearly a case of not having one type of analytics available, but we really needed to combine the best type of analytics we had and the best of our uh, specialists we had to create new types of applications. And some of it we will show you in a moment. It was about the ability to have access to the right data. Data was lacking. Um, as we got data in from different sources, we needed to clean up the data, combine it, and ensure that the data was high enough in terms of quality so that we could uh, uh, share that with other organizations. Also having medical and scientific expertise was crucial. Understanding and reading up on the science literature in terms of what we discovered on the virus and what the impact would be for, for example, pharmaceutical customers that run certain clinical trials uh, is really key. And um, we wanted to communicate really well and in a responsible way. So getting that uh, message out in a correct way to our organizations, to our customers, to organizations whom we decided to help was uh, key as well. And so one of the things we did is, um, and the first things we did in order to get a handle on the crisis, in which you can see um, in the next slide, is the dashboard that we created. We um, have uh, analytics uh, technology visual analytics technology that allows us to expose the uh, infection counts and to expose epidemiological parameters like incidence and prevalence parameters and plot it out with, um, um, on the geographic map, for example, here of the US. But we did the same if you go to our dashboard, which is still live, you'll see the same for other parts um, of the world, for example, um, for Canada as well. What this does is it gives organizations a view on what is happening and where we're going. Um, for example, Shireen, I believe, will speak about uh, supply chain and combining our epidemiological modeling capability with looking at where um, the pandemic is hitting the hardest allows pharmaceutical organizations to look at the impact of their supply chains and to ensure that not only in the context of the pandemic, but also in the context of other therapies so that um, that, that you could get those medicines in place at uh, hospitals, for example, and keep delivering them, which are needed for patients with cancer or patients with chronic diseases or for, um, for critical goods, for example, such as, uh, as foods, stocks that need to be supplied, etc. 
So um, having a dashboard like this is really helpful and being able to combine it with the data of an organization and looking at forecasting, looking at optimization was key. If I look at the type of analytics on the next slide, um, and um, this is really what um, we called outbreak analytics or prepared analytics, it was really from end to end across the board where um, organizations were applying analytics from surveillance techniques, which are very special techniques that you can apply on data that you're gathering. So being ready for what is going to happen tomorrow, next week, in a month's time to doing situational awareness, which we described with the dashboard, but also doing epidemiological modeling using different types of models. And there we, um, as um, Shireen will probably explain a little bit more as she goes through some of the impact there, is that we applied models that we gathered from academia from all over the world, and we rebuilt them and combined them with other analytics uh, techniques as well um, in our platforms. And so, um, looking at medical resource optimization is another uh, type of analytics routine and uh, looking at uh, if you have critical goods that are um, not available for everyone, what is the optimal way to distribute them across the vulnerable population or in a healthcare system so that you can keep open uh, your um, service lines. Doing contact tracing, for example, for public health and looking at the population level using de-identified telecom data and then finally, therapeutic analytics, of course, which is crucial for life sciences company, looking at how can we share data across research organizations? How can we look at real world evidence, observational data, and how can we look at repurposing existing therapies so that they could be uh, suited for this uh, particular virus? Um, one example in the next slide um, is Cleveland Clinic, where we have published what we have done with them, with the health, that big healthcare system in the US, and where we published that and made it available, um, those uh, epidemiological models via GitHub for other healthcare organizations to use um, for free and, and people can download it and organizations can download it and, and go in and study that and use it really to look at impact um, across those different analytics uh, methods. I will end and before I pass on to Stain by saying what is crucial is in this crisis, what we learned is not just good enough to have the best data. It's not just good enough to have the best analytics available, but you need a way to translate that to the decision makers. And that's what Cleveland did. They were able to translate it to their C-level staff so that they could make the right decisions to keep hospitals open and to keep serving patients, to keep ensuring that clinical trials keep going. And um, yeah, having that, that readiness available is really what contributes to their uh, resilience. And with that, I will uh, pass it on to Stein, who will talk more about the impact on clinical research and clinical trials specific of uh, this pandemic and what uh, that did. Stein. Thank you, Mark. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Perfect. Thanks and uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Stein Rogiers, and I'm part of uh, Mark Lambrecht's team. So I'm delighted to be here today and take you through a few um, slides, a little bit of content uh, around uh, clinical research and the mitigating delays in the clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please. And as Mark already talked about it, I think it's an exciting time. On the one hand side, it's um, challenging times. On the other hand side, it's really exciting times because we see uh, an acceleration of, um, of um, changes, I think, that we have been talking about for a long time. Uh, but as we all know, we are working into a risk-averse, um, very regulated industry. And so sometimes we need external factors to, to drive us and move us forward um, into the digitalization uh, that in other industries was already going on. Uh, taking it a little bit from an external point of view, um, we have, um, there is a, a certain documentation from, from Medidata, just one out of there, of course, there are many other uh, articles and publications in the same direction. Um, but Medidata has been updating on a monthly basis also uh, these, these reports. Uh, so this is from a couple of months back, but you can you can check it out yourself to to get the latest update. Um, where on the left hand side you see the impact uh, that that COVID nineteen uh, had on the ongoing uh, clinical trials. Uh, on the right hand side you see the impact uh, that COVID had on the new uh, new trial, uh, trials that were starting up or that were planning uh, to start up. Um, Seventy percent left hand side, eighty percent on the right hand side. Quite a big impact, as you can see. 
Um, so if we dig into, in the next slide, a little bit more into uh, further into the details around that, we can clearly see multiple um, areas of concern, multiple uh, impacts, um, especially let's get started on the, on the highest, uh, let's say, factors, uh, if a scale out of one to five here represented. Um, first of all, obviously, um, enrollment and, and recruitment and clearly uh, was heavily impacted. I think um, in another article it was mentioned even 20 to 30 uh, percent compared to before COVID, so March period uh, and uh, August, uh, September uh, in several regions. And um, again, enrolling, recruiting patients, getting patients to the hospital, um, uh, very critical and was was impacting um, indeed, as we said, not only the new new start new clinical trials that were starting up, but also the ongoing clinical trials. Uh, we were talking about uh, trial integrity. We were talking about uh, missing data. Uh, if uh, certain visits could not uh, take place anymore, and uh, what would be the impact of missing data? Uh, what would be impact of, of certain data that was missing, or maybe data from an entire visit that would be missing? Uh, how could that be changed maybe to still collect the data in another fashion? Uh, we talked about, um, as you can see also, the supply uh, of the medication at the bottom, uh, 2.17 there, how uh, the, the patients were either not getting into the sites anymore for the drug supply, um, and so the, or the drug supply couldn't be getting to the, to the site anymore. Uh, so as Mark told, there was clearly an, an issue on the pharmaceutical um, uh, side as well. So there were a multitude of uh, impacts. And then of course, also on the top, you can see the financial impact. Uh, pharmaceutical companies, uh, biotech companies, extremely worried about not only, um, let's say the impact on their study and the, and the patients, uh, because of course, patients is always our first need and, um, and, and concern. But then secondly, on the impact of the delays that those um, visits and certain studies that were put on hold uh, were having and uh, delays to interim analysis, to safety or DSMP analysis, and, and final uh, submission of your data to the authority. Uh, next slide. So if we, again, uh, go a little bit a step deep, uh, uh, take it in a next step uh, around uh, some of the actions that were taken by, by companies, um, we see uh, especially um, areas, again, here in the patient recruitment, uh, how could we really look into that to maybe switch to maybe uh, virtual visits, um, do it slightly different? Uh, we talked about indeed uh, the uh, patient visits on telemedicine, and you see there 44.66%. Uh, amendment of study protocols, and I will come back to that in a minute. So looking into how we can how we can on the one hand side maybe do changes to our study protocol and maybe uh, to, to limit maybe certain visits or change the way how we do visits uh, or document into the study protocol how we will collect the data, the data maybe differently. Um, but obviously there was also really an impact. Eh? You see clearly 43% delaying really the study. Uh, so that was, that, was, uh, that was really huge. Um, and on the next slide, um, we go a little bit more into detail into the different regions. <clears throat> Um, you see the um, two columns here, uh, the March as well as the April uh, comparison to the same period of last year, to 2019. And obviously you see that the impact is rather huge on, on the different um, regions, on, on all regions almost, but also, uh, also on the different therapeutic areas. Mm -hmm. And uh, even if you see today in the metadata article that is being updated constantly, um, you will see that um, the impact is obviously, as we all know, uh, depending on the COVID situation in each region and each, and each country, is a bit different um, and, and uh, needs to be treated differently, of course. And again, next slide. So how do customers really mitigate uh, these, these, uh, this situation? Yeah. Uh, first of all, we talked about drug supply. I think we mentioned that. So customers started looking at how can we indeed ship uh, the medication to the patient or maybe to nearby facilities. Yeah? How can we maybe um, look into that and then maybe track uh, more uh, the, uh, the, the medication as well. Uh, not only the delivery of the medication to the patient, but also how can we track 
maybe that the patient took the medication. Yeah. So not only through maybe uh, technologies, but also through uh, questionnaires that needed to be completed by the patient. Um, the data side, uh, we, we talked about for years, we talked about remote and central monitoring. But again, um, I think it was it was great that we took already so much investments last couple of years as an industry onto that. But now we really needed to go into an accelerated mode. Um, telemedicine visits I talked about and digital endpoints, another uh, technological evolution. Uh, think about it, uh, digital biomarkers and digital endpoints. Uh, about sensors and wearables that we have been talking as an industry, I think the last couple of five years. But again, due to the uh, regulatory, uh, heavy regulatory e driven industry, um, we have not really been uptaking these technologies often. And now I would say that because of the COVID drive and the acceleration due to COVID, we're finally there as an industry where we are really start uh, learning and introducing, obviously through pilot trials, uh, these these technologies. And of course, analytics plays a crucial role into that. On the right hand side, uh, um, bring the trials to the patient. Again, we have been talking a lot about patient centricity, and I think in almost every uh, company um, sites and, and patient engagement uh, groups and and roles have been established over the last couple of years. But now, finally, I think again uh, to, towards the topic of patient centricity, uh, we are now taking an acceleration moment. How can we bring the patient really into the center? How can we um, communicate with our patients uh, uh, from a distance, um, remotely, etc.? And screening and enrollment, we talked about that in the beginning, and Shireen will mention that uh, I'm sure in her talk as well. But uh, we have been talking with, with customers on the synthetic control arms. How can we maybe replace um, screening and enrolling of new patients and then putting those patients often in a control group uh, where they do not get the, the study treatment, they get a, maybe the comparator arm. So how can we avoid that? How can we limit that those patients maybe need to be screening? And how can we put on the one side the patients on the active drug? And how can we maybe replace that with real world data? Yeah, from maybe studies in the past and that we can build, bring in and of course change the protocol, etc. And then the last time um, patient engagement, I, I, I think Patrick um, in his presentation will talk about um, the, uh, the healthcare providers and how we better engaged with them. The same thing we can do with patients with mobile apps, with mobile devices, communicate, track where they are in their patient journey and also because of the patient journey and putting analytics on that, trigger immediate messages to the patient. Hey, are you still on your, on your treatment? Uh, we see you're not entering your, your medication anymore or your, 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 we see you're not entering your question anymore, what's going on? And so you can all automate these communications, these engagements with your patients to avoid that they are dropping out of your, of your study. And of course, to avoid safety issues and that they stay on their uh, medication. So I want to stop here and I want to give the word uh, to uh, my uh, next colleague who is Shireen Eight, and uh, she will take us um, further into this journey around the epidemiology and the impact on supply chain and manufacturing. Thank you, Sten. It's a pleasure being with you. Good morning or good afternoon or evening, wherever you may be in the world. Um, thank you for joining us today. So I'm gonna be talking about epidemiology and the impact on supply chain and manufacturing and how we can actually extend this into real world evidence and what roles it can play now. Um, on the next slide, we'll start talking about how we see this impact on life sciences, um, knowing that if we can identify forecasting and epi modeling, we can identify where it might um, affect supply chain manufacturing um, and disruptions. There might be some uh, disruptions within um, the demand um, and uh, either within delivery and um, shipment all the way through um, to access to care. Um, we also know that there's an opportunity here for our uh, life sciences um, colleagues to leverage observational research further, whether it is repurposing drugs um, that we've seen um, in, our, uh, in the global response to COVID-19 
also whether or not we could uh, leverage that observational research as part of the evidence package more fully and more comprehensively, looking at uh, drug safety profiles and a signal detection. And then um, again, repurposing drugs, not only um, extending the, the indication, but actually taking um, a drug that already has an established safety profile and extending it to a completely different therapeutic area. On the next slide, we'll see that um, one of the ways that we were able to look at um, and utilize our epi modeling was um, looking at advanced forecasting um, for COVID-19. We worked with a lot of very, very, in, uh, very, very smart and ingenious uh, modelers and epidemiologists um, here at SAS um, to support our global accounts and partners. Um, and one of the earlier um, issues that we had was with um, a supply chain disruption. And we really needed to be able to talk to and help this global company identify where um, their demands might change, um, being uh, depending on where that country was in the pandemic um, and on the curve. Um, also uh, supply chain disruptions and demand changes. And so at SAS, we were able to um, develop um, an SEIR model, which is a susceptible exposed, infected and recovered model to uh, predict uh, future COVID-19 cases um, within targeted regions. And then we were um, able to not only then take that model, but predict that course of the epidemic for that country or for that region and identify where disruptions and resolutions and adjustments to that supply chain can be anticipated and um, executed. We uh, worked very closely and continue to work closely with um, the United States um, Center for Disease Control um, and Prevention and um, uh, sitting on about five working groups around the modeling. And we were able to identify and model not only with um, a traditional SEIR model, but develop this model in a way that we actually had some uncertainty bands. Um, and so that there was the best possible scenario, the worst possible scenario, and the most likely scenario. This really allowed our, um, our partners to really understand the breadth and depth of how big or how bad that disruption could be or how easily it could be mitigated. Um, and then it allowed for many contingency plans and not just one. Um, we were also able to work with um, the uh, Cleveland Clinic, uh, it's a global healthcare system here, based here in the United States, but has offices and um, sites all across the world. And um, we were able to collaborate with them very easily and very um, intensely to provide for free um, an approach to the model, which would allow for accountability of market share, as well as um, context for lag, whether they, uh, patients were hospitalized or not. Um, and the way that Chris Donovan um, at the Cleveland Clinic um, would say is um, they would, <clears throat> the whole goal was to be able to identify and plan for the worst um, and hope for the best. And as a result, they were able to mitigate and repurpose some of their buildings, um, which didn't need to be used because they were able to then optimize um, their care for their patients without putting um, their caregivers and their patients at greater risk. On the next slide, we'll see that um, we were um, able then to take that work from the Cleveland Clinic and um, we have on our COVID-19 resource, resources hub page, um, the ability for anybody to log in and download and access this application that we've developed which is called the COVID-19 Epidemiological Scenario Analysis. It allows um, users to put in the parameters um, like uh, statistics, whether you have a different R or not, and reproductive re reproductivity rate um, for your region. Um, also regional statistics, so the population that you are concerned with, and then hospital statistics. If you are looking at this from a hospital network, you can identify what market share your hospital network usually co contributes to, if you are looking at public hospitals versus private hospitals, um, and then put in your hospital statistics as far as the average length of stay, the average use of ventilators and ECMO uh, machines and dialysis machines. Once you run that scenario, you can see a typical SEIR curve 
um, as well as then putting in some contingencies. So you're able to put some non-pharmaceutical interventions in there, whether or not you're closing schools, um, if you're closing non-essential businesses. Um, I apologize for the background noise um, because all of a sudden today they would decide to blow the leaves out. I apologize. Um, and so um, you're able to then, if you see at the bottom of the screen there on the right hand side, you'll see that I'm able to put in scenarios like closed schools and closed um, non-essential businesses, what that kind of, what kind of impact that might have on the curve. And then again, that gray band around the blue line shows your um, uncertainty bands. With, um, with the ability to do that through simulation, we have a lot of ability to give decision makers and policy makers um, the ability to identify what possible scenarios um, and contingencies that they need to be able to account for. Um, once you, once a user has been able to put in these parameters, they are able to look at um, a couple of scenarios where they look at different times of closure versus different, um, maybe uh, 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 different policies that are being implemented at different um, periods of time within the epidemic. And then they're able to look at that impact um, of the model and compare the scenarios. What if I were to close schools a week earlier or a week later? What if I were able to um, open non-essential businesses at 25% capacity instead of um, 50? How does that um, mitigate um, and impact my, uh, my region? Now we do know that what's really important is that although we were looking at this globally and it has a global impact, in order for us to really uh, manage um, and respond um, to this epidemic, and to the pandemic, our, our response is usually at a regional level and a local level. And so because of that, it was really critical that we were able to empower our partners at the regional levels so that they could have an overall impact on a global level. So on the next slide, um, we'll see how this overall, you'll see that this pandemic um, wasn't localized at all we were able to know that it was going to be a local response, but the impact, as you can see, was global on so many different levels, whether it was just through shipment or so, uh, general supply chain or an active ingredient or an inactive ingredient. Um, these were things that really did concern our partners. And when they did approach us early on, they trusted SAS and we were happy to be that trusted advisor to know that we had to be able to address um, this from a global point of view, but um, with the ability to mitigate at a local and regional level. In the end of the day, it would have impacted our, um, our ability to provide these medicines. And so leveraging the real, real world data and evidence to be able to do that <clears throat> is allowing us to rescue currently disrupted trials. We knew that uh, um, up to a third at some point of the trials were disrupted. Um, repurposing those products using um, safety profiles and data um, data that's available already on each of those um, each of the products, and um, doing some synthetic control arms. We did have a publication um, with Fuse EU Connect that demonstrating how one would go about um, identifying a synthetic control arm so that you're not you're minimizing the disruption to a, a current clinical trial and not um, prolonging the ability to see those insights and get those medicines to the patients quicker. And then finally, augmenting clinical trials, whether it's a pragmatic trial or um, a synthetic control arm, or just uh, um, addressing the ability to expand that um, the evidence package. So without further ado, um, on the next slide, I'll um, be happy to share some of the ways that we are partnering on real world data. Um, could the, one of the first ones is the Project Data Sphere that we've been um, very happy to host for the Cancer Roundtable, CEO Roundtable here um, um, in the United States. Um, we've worked with the Pioneer Project on the IMI Pioneer Project and the Hackathon. Um, and then finally, the COVID-19 Research Database, which is our newest, uh, one of our newer partnerships. Um, and that is um, where we provide the uh, part of the analytics package so researchers and academics can um, go further and mine that data and find great insights. And some of those uh, earlier projects now have actually been published. Um, finally, um, without further ado, I'm gonna trans uh, transfer over to Patrick.
Great, thank you, Shireen, and hello, everybody. I'm Patrick Homer, so we're, uh, speaking to you today from South Wales in the United uh, Kingdom, and I just want to say thank you for joining uh, joining us today. Uh, well, let's firstly start by turning the clock back uh, to the beginning of the year. Um, we were planning for business as usual, and during that business as usual, it was representatives calling up on physicians, educating sort of physicians uh, with uh, over the latest developments of the of the products they represented. Uh, pharmaceutical companies were getting ready to plan symposia and congresses uh, to again educate sort of all of their sort of physician uh, physician audiences around the globe. And then sort of uh, the pandemic started to strike and unfold in its ferocity. Uh, by February, uh, we realized we had an issue and sort of by March, uh, we all of these traditional channels of engaging uh, physicians were almost completely closed down, leaving us with just the sort of the one channel that was left and that was about digital engagement. So digital came from being a secondary sort of channel to having the sort of the highest priority for pharmaceutical sort of companies. Now, over the last couple of months, as we started to gravitate and explore uh, the experiences of what digital transformation and online engagement gave us, quite a number of research reports have been sort of published about the experiences. Firstly, the report on the left, uh, commissioned by sort of Reuters, uh, COVID-19, Accelerating Digital Transformation in Life Sciences. Uh, within this report, it looked at about 1,300 sort of executives uh, from across the pharma industry, uh, exploring the findings about the pandemic and the impact and what that would mean for the sort of the coming, uh, coming years. Uh, it talked about how virtual engagements with physicians had been mercilessly tested, uh, being thrust into the, sort of the real limelight of sort of everything became sort of a virtual. Uh, but at the same time, we were looking for opportunities to, uh, to accelerate innovation. You know, some of the findings from this report were sort of, you know, naturally we expected that, you know, the difficulties that would exist going forward in the face-to-face -face interactions with physicians. Uh, naturally, we would see a re significant reduction in budgets uh, that were going to be for medical conferences uh, in, the, sort of, uh, in the future. Uh, they're even talking about the impact on sales forces and, and predictions of about how much sales force or a headcount was going to be reduced. But it also started to look towards the role that webinars and webcasts and how this became the predominant engagements of a channel. The second report, which came much later and sort of was relatively just, uh, just recently published by Ernst and Young beyond COVID-19, a little smaller here, it's looking at sort of 500 uh, plus interviews from across, uh, across the industry. But again, this, you know, one of the leading conclusions from this was that um, the three channels of most impactful engagement uh, for HCPs, healthcare professionals, uh, initially was about live remote detailing about the impact of the sort of Zoom calls, how everybody started, uh, representatives turned towards Zoom calls to engage their physicians. Secondly, the next channel was about the webinars and the third channel was about e-meetings. But going forward, it also analyzed and, sort of, and made the predictions that webinars were going to be the major uh, engagement channel. So, you know, on the next slide, you know, what we show is that, you know, the webinar is really sort of coming to save the day. And uh, looking at the experiences that we've all sort of gained sort of in webinars over the last sort of eight months, um, we've become more bold, we've become more venturesome, our sort of cameras have gone on. Uh, we have started to do really creative things. It's not just about education uh, through a webinar experience, uh, a webinar now, it's about delivering experiences through webinars. And that's where sort of, we feel that the future is going to go delivering experiences uh, to physicians through a webinar process. The next slide, uh, I managed to listen in to uh, Bertrand Bodson, the Chief Digital Officer uh, from Novartis, just, uh, uh, just at the beginning of October during the HLTH sort of conference. Uh, where in a short presentation, 10-minute uh, presentation, he started to speak about sort of digital transformation. 
and came up with these three conclusions is that it's going to transform the way that we engage, again, underlining that word engage with patients and also with healthcare professionals. This movement was underway and what the pandemic has done was be, has been to accelerate the scaling and the adoption of this transformation. And it has really started to challenge us now to find new ways of engaging, new personal, personalized ways of engaging with, with physicians. So moving on to the next slide, you know, we had the opportunity to be able to work with a major pharmaceutical company at the beginning of the sort of pandemic, and that was being uh, AstraZeneca. Now, as to AstraZeneca during this uh, time, uh, wanted to run a series of webinars across the globe, so sort of global in nature, to better educate sort of physicians who, uh, with physicians who were at the front end uh, of fighting the pandemic, to relay their experiences to physicians around the globe uh, who had yet to sort of confront and started to treat patients uh, for uh, uh, for sort of COVID nineteen. So to be able to do this, they started to commission a series of webinars and we managed to get involved with them, uh, leveraging some of our analytical technology. So on the next slide, you know, what we'll see is that, you know, three simple questions that they initially wanted to get addressed. Which healthcare professionals attended? Where did they come from? Which channels? And within the webinars that they were holding, what was the most important content? So in other words, what we started to do here is change the dynamics anyway of trying to get a better understanding of the experience, the physician experience that they have within the sort of the webinar. And to be able to do this, we engaged uh, what we call our customer intelligence solution suite within SaaS. And this is technology that is used predominantly has been used in the retail industry and the banking industry over the last decade plus. Of course, now that sort of a farmer was left with digital only, engaging this type of technology to get this new level of insights was something that was needed to be explored. On the next slide, we will see that sort of that you know we managed to uh, work with the executive sponsor for our, of this initiative uh, called Nick Passy, who's the vice president, commercial digital and IT at AstraZeneca. And I was quite fortunate because at the end of this experience, Nick came and joined us at SAS anyway, and we delivered a webinar, uh, an on-demand webinar, so about improving online engagement in pharma during COVID-19. Just a 20 minute discussion where I managed to interview Nick about the experiences that he had of you know, when this started and sort of what did he find, what did he discover? So well, what we show is that, you know, here is just a highlight of, you know, some of those, uh, those findings. Next slide, please. So Nick first spoke about the hunger, the scientific hunger that physicians had from around the sort of the world of trying to, you know, find out, you know, this, you know, what was being used, what, how other physicians from around the globe were starting to treat sort of COVID nineteen. The scale, the magnitude of these webinars mercilessly tested uh, the sort of the systems that were in place. During these webinars, you know, we were looking at sort of 40,000, 50,000 physicians from around the globe sort of joining. So, you know, scale became a sort of a, a major, major issue. And during that scale, maturity, process maturity uh, was uh, tested to the uh, uh, to to a degree. Uh, Nick spoke about that, you know, historically, naturally, the webinars had been done in the past, but not to this scale, and, uh, and historically had never really dug deep into the, so the data before. And this is what this exercise was, is about generating new data, and what did the data tell them so that they could, over a rapid period of continuous, in, uh, continuous iterations, how we could improve that engagement experience. The insights, this was dripping with significant insights. Now we've been deploying this type of technology, uh, say for many industries over, over the last, uh, last decade. You know, some of the things that we start to uh, start to find 
uh, with, uh, with it within these uh, uh, industries is that, you know, for, for one example, we call it the fall off factor. You know, what we find is that during registration, you may think that, you know, you've got 40,000 physicians that are sort of going to be joining. But the reality is, is that at the last moment, they're trying to get in, but the registration process can be a little bit more complicated. Uh, sort of uh, maybe four pages of you know, information that needed to be filled in. Well, during this, and if, especially if it's a physician on a front line of a sort of pandemic, uh, you know, they didn't go through and fully complete. So we see it's all significant drop off of sort of, uh, of physicians trying to get through to the, uh, to the webinar, but, you know, failed at the registration for, uh, phase. Finding that the audiences, you know, we like to think that, you know, we're all sat behind computers now and that physicians are also sitting behind computers. But what we find is that generally they're not. They're taking in uh, WebEx context, webinar content on a sort of a mobile phone. Now, and by that, you know, we may have designed materials, we may have designed slideshows that sort of work well uh, for a PC driven audience. But when they're sort of joining by a mobile phone, uh, then, you know, the customer experience is significantly altered uh, from that. We started to discover sort of regional variances, you know, the Chinese HCPs, uh, physicians, they wanted to listen to the Chinese speakers. Uh, the Egyptians wanted to listen to the Egyptian speakers and would only tune in for that, uh, that period of time. South Africans, though, they wanted, because the pandemic hadn't really reached them at this time, they stayed on for the whole duration and took everybody's point of view in. So around the world, we start to see all these different geographical variations from all the different audiences that typically hasn't been served up before. We can start to identify technical issues. You know, Nick spoke about this one, uh, one example of a country of being heavily marketed towards and said that they were going to uh, attend, you know, significant attendance from this country. Nobody turned up on the day. What was the issue? Uh, was the issue from uh, from uh, the side of that was running the webinar? Essentially, tracking it back, what we discovered is that the undersea cable to that country sort of failed, and so it was a complete sort of a uh, complete failure in the sort of technical uh, in the technical uh, uh, in the in the way that sort of a, that this audience could technically engage with the webinar. So now having now understood that issue and that all these physicians were trying to get to see it, but couldn't, what do you do with them? What's the most appropriate follow up? Ultimately though, Nick started to speak about sort of a precision, about how, it, how he could better understand sort of a physicians, their behavior, which allow for de better degrees of, of partnerships, uh, per, sorry, better degrees of personalizations. And that partnerships and partnerships such as with SAS, we help them sort of discover new ways of engaging with their, sort of, with their physicians. So if you'd like to discover more, if you go to the next slide, you'll see and just Google sort of analytics in sort of 20, Sorry, Cameron, can we go to the next slide? Uh, so just go to analytics in 20 and sort of uh, where the red arrow is, the second uh, webinar down, you'll get to hear sort of uh, Nick Passy speak about in full the experiences that they had uh, of, uh, of engagement throughout the, throughout the pandemic. So on to my final slide, you know, we're now at this significant sort of uh, evolution of sort of, uh, of engagement. Um, you know, and for SAS, you know, it's, this is a great experience that we've been through uh, sort of the pandemic of, of working with life sciences and how we can significantly help them evolve their sort of our online, sort of our online experiences. Uh, you know, digital, we can say that, you know, the digital monster is now sort of out of the bag and it's here to stay. Uh, it's often a very personal sort of experience. It's down to us now to um, all the experiences that we've had over the last number of months of uh, you know, being sort of you know, digital only is to look at all the experiences that we've gained and how we can sort of channel those into sort of further improving our online engagement and driving rapid evolution in the way that we conduct uh, with physicians in the future. 
So that concludes my uh, concludes my and it concludes the SAS part of this sort of presentation. Uh, before we start, the, I'll hand back to sort of Wendy to start the Q and A. Uh, should you wish to engage with SAS and any of ourselves as speakers, please contact your local sort of representatives uh, representing SAS Canada. We've got Scott Nason and we've got Harsh Barden. Uh, so the details are here. Um, these will be shared with you sort of later, and we'd look forward to sort of uh, having further dialogue with you. But Wendy, if I could hand over back to you now for Q and A, thank you. Thank you very much, Patrick. Um, I'm noticing that we are almost out of time, so I'll just ask um, a couple of questions. Um, your presentations were extremely interesting, and we could talk for hours about um, any one of the things that you that you brought up. Um, so. Um, one of the things that I think is so interesting is, you know, as a society, we are hearing data every day, whether it's the number of cases or this morning, um, at least on the um, Vancouver CBC news, there was lots of discussions about predictive um, caseloads and what that may, that may happen both in BC and uh, specifically Alberta, which is having some challenges right now. And so you sort of opened up the box for a lot of people to see uh, what's behind all of these predictive uh, uh, numbers that we see every day. So I appreciate, I appreciate you doing that. Um, Livleen asked a question, and I think it goes back to our first one of, uh, one of our first speakers. And that is, do you have a sense of when the backlog of delayed studies is expected to be cleared or caught up? I think I will start and then maybe others can join or add. Um, I think it really depends from, from the region. Uh, we still see now with the COVID and with the different you know, phases of COVID in the different regions and countries that there is really uh, that um, that, uh, that was first going down and now it started again and there is maybe a third wave coming or even a fourth wave. And uh, we, of course, we, we finally get vaccines there, but we are not there, of course. First, the vaccines need to be getting to every patient in every, or every person in every country and that will take a lot of time to get there. So I think it depends um, on region, on country, but also... Um, we have a huge backlog, of course, uh, due to COVID. There is an enormous backlog that we have on, on, on clinical trials. And uh, so it will take, I think, definitely a year or two to, to, to reduce, uh, to get uh, that backlog away. Um, and, and then also therapeutic area. Right? It depends also therapeutic area, per therapeutic area, it will be different, of course. So you cannot answer that with one, you know, with one uh, definitive answer, but there are three factors, I think, the region and country. Um, the therapeutic area, and of course, um, yeah, the, the impact that it had uh, on all of that um, from an indication perspective. Yeah. That's my view. Anything you want to add um, from the rest of the team, Shireen, Mark? Yeah, just for, from my end, saying that um, what we see is that pharma CEO, CIOs are now investing, and I think that's an indirect consequence and an indirect response to the question, but they're investing heavily in digitization and analytics platforms in what uh, Stan has described, uh, making these trials more robust to that kind, of, those kind of changes, and it all comes down um, that if you decentralize your activities, whether it's supply chain, whether it's data analytics, or whether it's what uh, Patrick described in terms of um, your operations in, in interacting with physicians, that at the same time you need more central analytics capability and a readiness facility to do that. Mm -hmm. And I think you'll see that as a consequence of this um, pandemic that a lot of pharma companies are um, are moving in that direction in, in clinical research specifically and will be investing heavily in that. Um, and I think you'll see a catch up in, in many ways. So uh, some good will, or a lot of good will come, unfortunately, from this sad uh, episode uh, in our history. Yeah, one thing that we didn't really have a chance to talk about today was um, the actual patient's presentation um, to their physicians and how much later in their disease progression um, are they presenting. Um, so where we have diagnostics and indications for therapeutics at say stage zero or one, um, now patients are less likely to present that early. Um, they might be presenting at phase two or three. And so is that now no longer an indication for your medicine, um, for your product? Does that mean that you need to re-examine your launch plans that have been developed um, you know, two years back pre-COVID. Um, and so those are some of the things that we haven't even scratched the surface with this time. Hopefully we can get into a deeper dive, but catching up and then changing 
what our expectations for what that catching up is um, and what it means really needs to be addressed collectively as an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you, of course, need people in the hospital as well for that. Eh? If we don't underestimate, we can talk about technology, but you, of course, also need people in the hospitals to catch up. And uh, to one of the other points, one of my colleagues in, in Canada, Greg Horn, mentioned that we have an older population and actually a retirement of a lot of healthcare professionals more and more. So that's another thing we need to take into account uh, towards the future. People are really dropping out and need to be replaced by young, dynamic, new nurses and physicians, uh, but that will take time. And so that's another challenge uh, that we are coming across, I think, um, soon in the, in the near future. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, many of us have said that, you know, 2020 has been the year that we've been chasing science and, you know, we're learning, we're learning as we go and uh, data is clearly critical. There's so many aspects of our society that is, that have changed. And I think even prior to COVID, we all knew that, you know, data, we were in the revolution of data and it's such an important asset um, that we need to leverage and COVID-19 has exposed that significantly. And each one of your presentations talked about different aspects of that and would love to have more time to dive in at, at another time, as you say. But I think um, now, surprisingly enough, we've actually hit the end of the hour. We're a little bit over. Um, so I wanna thank um, all of you, Mark, uh, Stan, Shreen, Patrick, for, um, for your presentations today. Also Scott and uh, Harsh, who, um, who Patrick mentioned are our local SAS reps, so please reach out to them. Um, their information was uh, on these slides, but also you, if you have trouble getting a hold of them, you can get a hold of us and we can connect you. Um, so again, I'd like to thank you very much. This was really engaging, an area, as I say, of great passion for me personally. Um, so I thoroughly enjoyed it. As with all of our events, we um, put a little shout out to what's coming up. So we have our regional showcase series continues next week where we will be virtually in Surrey. Um, so if you'd like to learn about what innovation is happening there, please join us. We're having a fun holiday social, uh, which will be a webinar without presentations. And uh, we're gonna try and create some, some fun virtually um, at four o'clock on, these are all PSD times uh, next week. The JP Morgan conference is coming up, which we will be there trying to uh, facilitate and enable business opportunities for BC innovative companies. Uh, we have a Gardner showcase event and our Career Connect Day in January. Our annual conference access to innovation will be in February. And um, then we're going to be having a, we have an investor readiness program right now that we will be having a graduation where we can showcase the companies that have gone through that in March in our regional showcase in Victoria. So with that, thank you very much for joining us. We always wanna thank our sponsors as well that uh, through their support, uh, allow us to do everything that we do on behalf of the ecosystem in British Columbia. So thank you very much for that. And with that, I will close off the webinar. A reminder, it's been recorded and it will appear on our website um, and in our newsletter later today. So please feel free to download it or share it um, with people that you think would be interested in the content. Thanks very much. And thank you, SAS team. You've been a pleasure to work with and it's been fun, fun meeting you from all different corners of the world. And hopefully we can do this in person. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks for having us. Okay. Stay safe. Bye-bye.